Welcome everybody. Uh, we're gonna wait for just a few more folks to join. Uh, we're so excited to see you today, to take this time with us. We'll get started in just a minute. You don't feel like you have to keep your camera on since this is gonna be more of a presentation. Um, so use this time to grab yourself some lunch and we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, well, thanks everyone for joining us. We might have a few people pop in as we go. Um, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm Nina Morris. I'm the Sustainability Director with Penn Sustainability Office. And I'm really grateful that we've got some amazing speakers with us today for our uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration event that focuses on environmental justice and the connections between urban greening and gun violence. We appreciate you taking part taking time to take part in today's conversation, and we hope to share with you the connections of these perhaps seemingly disparate topics of how race, issues of race and justice weave these topics together, and what we can do to help our West Philadelphia neighborhoods through a greater understanding of what makes a community flourish. Each year, Penn Sustainability hosts an environmental justice focused event around Martin Luther King Day to honor his commitment to racial equality, the basis of which inspired the concept of environmental justice. Environmental justice was the last topic Dr. King focused his advocacy and leadership towards before his assassination, which took place in Memphis, Tennessee, where he was marching with garbage workers who were experiencing environmental injustice through their exposure to environmental hazards at work. Dr. King's participation in this march shows him living out his belief that all life is interrelated and shows us that we should not uphold systems and environments that prioritize certain people over others. To me, this is the foundation of environmental justice. I hope today's conversation with our distinguished guests helps to make clear what, what are these systems today that uphold environmental burdens and how they impact violence in our communities. We hope today's event inspires you to take action and we will follow up with ways you can get involved with UC Green's volunteer efforts. I'll hand it over to Scott Filkin, Director of Penn's Office of Social Equity and Community to moderate today's event. Scott. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. As Nina said, uh, my name is Scott Philk and I serve in Penn's Office of Social Equity and Community where we seek to advance Penn's pursuit of social justice on and around campus. We're joined today by our three panelists and I'd like to introduce them now. First, we have Ms. Lori Hayes. Ms. Hayes is the Director of Urban Forestry for Philadelphia's Department of Parks and Recreation. As the leader of Philadelphia's urban for forestry efforts, Ms. Hayes Offer, oh, I'm sorry, oversees many projects, including the Tree Philly Program, the Street Tree Planting and Maintenance. And she work, she's worked uh, at PPR since 1981, serving as landscape project technician, park district manager, and North Regional Manager. Welcome, Lori. Glad to have you with us. Thank you. Good day. Next, we have Ms. Keisha Hewlin who serves as the director of UC Green, where she works for equitable and accessible greening in West Philadelphia. Ms. Hewling has a background in community health and social work, having worked with Penn's Injury Science Center and the SARE Health Center. She earned a master's in social work in the School of Social Policy and Practice here at Penn. Welcome, Keisha. How and are we have, you? It's good to be here. Thank you. Good. Uh, and we have uh, Dr. John McDonald, Professor of Criminology and Sociology and the undergraduate chair in Penn's School of Arts and Sciences Criminology Department. He works on a variety of topics in criminology, including the study of crime and violence, race and ethnic disparities in criminal justice, and the effect of public policy response to crime. Welcome, John. Thank you all for being here. And thank you again to our audience as well. Uh, we're so glad that you've chosen to join us today. Uh, Please feel free to place any questions you might have in the chat. Laura Barron, who's behind the scenes, uh, will uh, help out to get those to us uh, if time remains. 
When the Office of Social Equity and Community and Penn Sustainability decided to collaborate on an MLK event, we did what most would do. We went looking for a quote to get started. To my surprise, Dr. King hadn't said much about environmental issues until the very end of his life, but he did understand the real connections existing uh, in the world, connections that impact people's lives. The quote that most informed today's conversation begins with this observation. All mankind is tied together. All life is interrelated. John, your research looks at how intentional greening or cleanup of a neighborhood can impact gun violence in the area. That's a fascinating connection. Would you tell us a bit about what you've learned? Sure. Uh, so series of studies uh, and partnerships with groups like PHS here in Philadelphia, we found that things from uh, cleaning and uh, greening uh, vacant lots, uh, for example, uh, found both an experimental work where we actually ran a trial, uh, randomly assigning lots to be greened, um, those to kind of stay on green for a period of time, as well as just tracking uh, the progression of the vacant lot greening initiative over time, we find significant reductions in gun violence. Uh, we've done work looking at uh, abandoned housing remediation, finding uh, efforts uh, to remediate abandoned houses, fairly low cost, reduce gun violence. There's some emerging work also looking at something as simple as just picking up the trash more regularly on the street uh, can reduce gun violence. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll wait to weigh in on more of lecture mode, but there's different theoretical reasons to understand that. But I think it also just connects to what you brought up about our common humanity. And when people are living uh, in cleaner, greener uh, environments where the built environment isn't so disordered, uh, their stress levels go down, their sense of community engagement, the ability of people to feel like it's a place that they can socialize, all these things type to start to change. And I think we sometimes discount the powerful role that place has on people. Uh, and, and so some of this research is pointing to that and it's, it's uh, heartening now that it's getting more attention because uh, for years when I mentioned this work to people, they would either, they just didn't believe it. They thought that there's just no way that, you know, something, uh, focusing on places uh, can have such a transformative effect. So it's nice to have this conversation and to see the attention that more of the work that, that people are doing in the community to really make a difference uh, can have. And in some ways, all I'm doing is science to explain what other people are doing. Uh, and, uh, and it's nice to see the evidence emerge. It is, and it's encouraging evidence, isn't it? To quote Dr. King again, um, probably many of us who have been so urbanized and modernized need at times to get back to the simple rural life and commune with nature. We fail to find God, says the preacher, because we are too conditioned on seeing man-made skyscrapers, electric lights, airplanes, and subways. Keisha King suggests here that one must leave the urban setting if she wants to convene with nature but you're working uh, to change that. Could you explain how community well-being and health are connected to the environment, especially to nature? Sure. Um, so I would preface it with uh, the environments that we live in now and the amount of resources that it takes to get away, right? To um, vacation and move from your proximate environment requires a, um, a certain amount of like privilege and access to be able to um, get out and get into nature um, and leave the cities. And so what is crucial and what we've been working on at UC Green is bringing greenness into the environment and bringing them into our homes. 
Um, that's easy to do through street uh, tree planting. So it's right there. We have greenness right on our blocks. Um, advocating for green spaces, uh, vacant lots that are turned into accessible mini parks, uh, block cleanups that encourage uh, amplifying the green that is available in our little row houses here in the city, and endearing folks to our public parks. So those are all things that create an environment of greenness and accessible greenness while staying in an urban environment. And that is really important um, for us because it becomes part of our daily function. And so it's what we do um, throughout our day and not something that we have to escape uh, kind of the, con the notion of the concrete jungle to access, but something that is um, providing us with the, the wellness, the calming, um, the physical, the you know, space to be physically active um, in a routine way that's incorporated in our lives. Thank you. Laurie, if you're able, um, in our first conversation, words like social capital and dignity came up quite a bit. What do these terms mean to your work and the city's mission to expand access to urban green space? Well, when it comes to social capital, we all look at, say, the haves and the have nots. I'm always looking to increase what you can achieve, no matter where you are. Say, if you think about it and you wanna develop it in your community, there's always some room as we've talked about reclaiming vacant lots or just green spaces or even planting trees on the street. Well, all of that takes a bit of money and budgeting. So yes, that's the part about the capital. And um, I oversee tree work throughout the city, Northeast, Northwest, Center City, and South. So I have to keep in mind what we're doing across the board. And to follow up on that, and I'd invite everyone into this at this point, uh, please jump in as you see fit. Um, how have you seen environmental inequities impact neighborhoods? And how has greening changed them? Everyone loves a story. Anecdotally, what changes have you seen from trees uh, in the community? Keisha, maybe you'd like to start. <laughs> yeah, take that. <laughs> um, and so for me, um, the transformation are um, what happens whenever you see a greener environment or an environment that was previously um, not as flush with, with trees. Um, there's several steps that happen. Um, there's organizing. And so there is an investment um, from community members that say that this is something that we want to see in our community. Um, and there's the coming together of community members and so community members being organized. Um, so that is like a first step that you see. Um, and organizing as a community in and of itself is its own type of social capital. Um, the ability to come together around a shared interest or issue. Uh, and then the power of seeing something come to fruition from those efforts uh, endears folks to feeling a sense of ownership, a sense of I have a say, someone is listening to me um, about what I want in my community and together we have power. Um, and so there's the organizing that you see happening um, that, that is an endorsement of a stronger community. Um, and then there's the actual execution of that greenness. And so if it is a block that gets together to, um, to plant trees, and so they all have trees, um, they, UC Green will plant um, a, a huge amount of trees for one block. And so it, it looks like impact because it's happening all at once. And then there's this conversation that happens on a community level around caring for those trees together. And so um, Ms. So-and-so needs to water her tree a little bit more. I don't know if that tree down the block is thriving. This is really my favorite tree. So there's community, there's conversation and community that happens around this tree because are these trees, because it's something that a community has done together. And so you see that um, social cohesion start to build um, and the advocacy for the maintenance of the trees, the check-in around the trees, the stories that come from uh, this, this was, a, you know, we planted this tree the first year that you lived on the block. And here we are five years later and this tree is essentially tracked like your growth as a member of our block 
and a member of our community. And so fun things like that happen. But um, aside from the visual impact is the people impact. And so this, um, this connection that folks have, the um, advocacy and the organizing that it takes to get trees planted. Those are the heaviest endorsements for me of a strong community. And so where I see lots of trees, I know that there are people that care. Um, and where I see that there are not a lot of trees, that is not immediately an indication of people um, that don't care. It is an indication of people that aren't being heard. And so to me, it's an indication of folks that you know, need to be listened to, um, need to come together and be supported in their organizing um, and that their organizing efforts, their concerns and their needs be endorsed. And that's what we do at UC Green so that they can feel that same empowerment. I love that trees are conveners, that we gather around trees and that they have stories and histories and they tell, they tell the story of the neighborhood. And John, you see this show up in the research that that people's lives are changed um, when trees come into the area. Yeah, we um, we see everything from not just uh, you know reductions in things like gun violence, which I know is part of the focus of today's discussion, but improvements and uh, relative improvements in uh, in mental health in terms of uh, depression. Uh, we see that residents, uh, which is you know we just a good example, right, are more likely to socialize with each other. So if you think about all the ways that, you know, uh, that, that nature helps us as human beings, uh, it makes sense, you know, that, uh, you know, these stories actually translate into data uh, that you can show you scientifically. I mean, there's even old studies that just something simple as comparing people's stress levels uh, when they're exposed to, say, concrete, uh, versus grass and trees, and you find that heart rates go down and uh, stress levels change. So, I mean, you can see this, you know, uh, physiologically uh, in people. Uh, and um, and uh, as, as Keisha was mentioning that, you know, this doesn't require, you know, taking a trip to National Park, but what it does require is, you know, more spaces uh, to be like this. And, um, and I think sometimes uh, from a policy perspective, there's too much emphasis on creating big, huge uh, signature parks and so forth and not thinking about you know, the fact that you can have all these little spaces that people then will have access to uh, and they won't be cut off. And, uh, and you know, part of this is a legacy also of just bad planning. You know, there was a lot of development that was made without tree consideration, without green mm -hmm. space, uh, and it's just not a natural way for people to live healthily, you know, that, that we need to be in nature. I mean, it's connected to, you know, uh, just our DNA as human beings. And, uh, you know, it's, I think it's just it often, you know, in the interest of de development, uh, sometimes uh, there hasn't been enough effort, effort placed on setting aside space for people to be surrounded by trees and to, and to have access to green space. And Laurie, we have Fairmont Park, a huge city park, um, and we're working to. You're working to get trees around the city. What are you seeing uh, on the ground in Philadelphia as trees are planted? Well, we are working on the Philly Tree Plan, which we'll look at ten years out. But in my own experience, say the greener the better. We have rules and we've been looking at street trees since about 1910 in the city about where you can plant or types of trees. And I was a tree inspector in the 1980s. And one thing that came to mind while we're talking is if we removed a tree, we had to replace a tree. Maybe not in that same location, but in the same zip code. So yes, we're working to improve our canopy. Um, a great canopy could be 30%. Oh, that's wonderful. But if we could get to the mid 20s or so of our canopy cover in the city, and a lot of times we can't just look at the curb line. We talk about street trees, but look at those narrow residential streets. Maybe I can get some trees on the roof. Maybe I can get you to train 
a non-invasive vine on the side of your house. Greenery is greenery. So yes, we're looking to improve as time goes on. And for me, being around so many years, I want children to know trees. I will tell you just yesterday, I had an encounter with a paper birch. I looked and I said, oh, look at that exfoliating bark. And there were three of them and they were birches. And I was by myself, but I had a feeling with that experience. I just want kids to know, maybe you know beyond an oak gives you an acorn, a pine tree gives you a pine cone. I, I just like drive by botany when you're on the school bus, when you're in the car with your parents. Can we just learn about trees and what they give to us? Not when they're just down and blocking and prohibitive in our lives. I see in all three of you joy because of trees. Uh, as you talk about the trees, you all light up. It, it, it's beautiful. If I could be the devil's advocate for just a minute though, uh, isn't it hard to know if urban greening is actually making a difference? There's correlation and there's causation. How do we know uh, which one is in play right now uh, as trees get planted? Well, I would say we, we have pretty better than correlational evidence. Now we have experiments uh, so that that I think negates that. But I mean, there's also just common sense. Uh, you know, uh, if you think about, you know, through human history, right? The value that nature has and people, you know, why do people with resources spend money on this for hundreds of years? I mean, if you go to uh, an old university, older than Penn, so you go to Cambridge or Oxford, you'll see the amount of resources they spend on their gardens and their green space, it's, you know, uh, you know, this is true around the world. So where there's resources, people spend it on nature. So, um, I, you know, we have experiments that I think rule out that this is just correlation, but I also would say we also just have human history and the evidence over, over time. Uh, and just some of the neighborhoods, you can see the difference yourself too. If you just witness what's like within one planting season, a, of, of, of a few lots being changed on a block um, and the stories that people tell, how much it makes them feel better, uh, how much it is, how much more benefit they feel not having an eyesore next door. I think, I, so one of the conversations that I often have um, with, with residents and neighbors is that um, planting a tree does not, there's not a direct relationship. Like if I plant a tree in front of my house, then um, I am immediately reducing uh, the gun violence um, in my zip code because I have a tree in front of my house. Um, it is, again, it's those, it's those steps. Um, and so the relationship that we see in terms of the value of greenness is that um, to have a tree in front of your house um, means that um, you've, you know, you've thought, and this is kind of a lofty idea, but the notion of thinking beyond um, your immediate home. And so the people in your home, the food in your refrigerator, um, the structural safety of your home, and then beyond that, you are visioning and imagining, I'd love to have um, a cherry tree out in front of my house. And so that level of like that, the breadth of concern you see in other spaces. Uh, these, are, these are the same folks that will um, call and check on someone that's part of their congregation whenever they haven't heard from them. The same person, the same people that will, you know, be a block over and maybe see, you know, one of the kids on their block and be like, aren't you supposed to be in school or at home or something? Um, and so that kind of connection in terms of um, being concerned and not even directly like as an individual, but I've advocated to, um, to my council member, we don't have enough trees. There are not enough block cleanups. Our trash wasn't picked up. Um, and so that kind of civic engagement and um, that civic responsibility, we certainly see make its way into being a community that advocates for, um, takes a stance against um, violence in their community and gun violence. Is it, um, is it directly, if you have trees, then you don't have gun violence? No, um, we know that I can think of several um, beautifully green neighborhoods that are, are our whole city um, is riddled with gun violence right now. 
but it does, it, it, to me, trees are an indicator um, and maintained trees, um, that there, there is a community that is, um, that is able to be organized and advocate for and speak out and uh, be a, a helpful collaborator with city resources in addressing gun violence and gun violence issues. Um, and so tree, again, for me, trees, as I, I ride through the city, it is trees serve as um, like a small um, way of measuring so many things. Um, and I think we all know that if you drive up, oh, even parts of Market Street or Germantown Avenue, as, as you drive through and you um, observe the tree canopy and the greenness and how they're maintained, you also can understand um, what communities are resourced with. Um, who has been um, underserved or environmentally neglected, um, and um, who it has the resources in the capital. Um, and not so much as an indicator of, of class, but an opportunity and an indicator of the work that we have to do as a, um, as a, as a Philadelphia community, um, as city government, um, as tree planters um, like myself and the partners that, um, that UC Green works alongside. Yeah, I would just echo uh, everything just said in terms of, you know, this, it's, it's not like if you plant a tree, it blocks a bullet, you know, this is more about, you know, what, how does it bring people together and to, you know, you know, does this help communities establish, it's one facilitator of establishing collective efficacy or, you know, social capital that people are willing to help each other out, they have a sense of neighborhood. Also, that sends a signal to people that, you know, might be inclined to uh, be carrying a gun and, and uh, that this is a block that, you know, this behavior is not going to be as tolerated on, that residents actually are, you know, caring about the space here. And so there's, you know, there's kind of multiple things going on, but I think it's it's a signal and it's a, the idea of convening people. I think it's, this is, um, yeah, you get a strong sense that the block's being cared for, you know, just a vision, you know, a, you know, not just, you know, you can feel it, you know, when you're there. It's even hard to explain, but you just notice something feels different. And, uh, and you know, I think that's true for everyone in that space. Beyond um, just the, the trees as an indicator, if you think about what it takes to participate in urban gardening, and I'm specifically thinking about one of the gardens that you see green stewards is Holly Street Neighbors Community Garden, which was established by my predecessor. Um, and if you are occupying a space and you're occupying a space um, towards greening and you're active and you're, you, there's certain things um, that you, you know, you're just, you're, that aren't gonna happen in that same space. Um, and so I guess a, a, a fair example um, would be, you know, if I was uh, growing up, if I was supposed to be doing my homework at the kitchen table, um, then my brother was not going to sit, sit there and play table ping pong at the kitchen table because my, my doing my homework took priority. And so if, I, um, if I'm gardening in Holly Street Neighbors Community Garden and I'm um, working on um, planting some perennials at that curb, um, the, you know, the kids that, are, that, are, um, that have been going back and forth over Twitter, they're less likely to have a complete confrontation right in front of an adult. Right? So even in, in a very small and tertiary, like a very small way, those how you occupy space and how you um, how you in, endear spaces in a community. Um, this is why we always have the conversation around, you know, utilizing our, our recreation centers and having them be active and vibrant, having programs and activities for youth there. And so trees, gardening. Um, horticulture in general are just indicators of thriving communities and active communities. Um, and what we've experienced and what data has bore out um, around where gun violence is happening in, in the city, um, it is in those spaces where um, there, there aren't other things going on. Um, and so as much as you work to cultivate those mini parks, those community gardens, those other things are going on. And that is um, passively, but powerfully a deterrent for crime. It's interesting to me that the research has literally changed the landscape um, and, and brought in greening. What more do groups like UC Green or Tree Philly need from the research community? What questions would you like to see answered 
moving forward. Anybody? Lori, do you have do you have questions you would like to see the research community answer? Yes. I'm sitting here and I'm listening and I echo all of this because I am a city girl, Philadelphia, my whole life and all that. And when I talked about the street trees, I grew up, I grew up on a block that'll never have trees at the curb line because there's no room. You know, you don't want to open your car door on a tree. Simple as that. But some of the civic pride and the cleanliness and lawfulness, that has to be improved. You can send your child to a rec center, but if it's not safe or clean, who wants to go there? We had a little motto, clean, safe, and ready to use out here in the department with Philadelphia Parks and Recreation. You gotta have the cleanliness and you need enforcement. Like we always look for block captains. You have to have somebody who holds the key to saying, uh-uh, we're not doing that here. And that's what I think we need more of. Like we always say teachers in school. In many ways, they're the enforcers. Like I tell people, I don't make the rules, but I'll enforce a rule all the time. And I look at that in the city. When we see news articles on TV, I always look for trash on the street. And you see it. I charge you to look. When you see the news reporter standing in the street with the microphone, look at the surroundings. I say we clean up to green up. You just can't green up without cleaning. I really feel that there's a hierarchy of getting things done. I am the number one tree planter in the city. Quote me on that. I don't even, I can't count, but you never forget a tree that you've planted. And I remember I said about planting one and removing one. I can drive through like a Ron Street in the Northeast and say, ah, I planted that tree there. And I still feel good about it. But when neighborhoods change, I still feel it because of the memories of growing up in certain neighborhoods. You look at it and somebody has to be an advocate. I tell you, I could walk around and listen to Kiasha all day because you really hit the subject matter over the head, but you need help. It's beyond UC Green. It's the groups and communities, if we could interact and knit them together in a positive way, sort of like the Horticultural Society does. And I really appreciate what Penn is doing this afternoon. And it's about knitting and cohesiveness because that's where it has to begin. Again, it's the pride, the civic pride. I used to be a part of clean block judging. Anybody remember that? And they would go out and the blocks would shine and just stand out with their chest out and talk about how, how many times they swept or cleaned up. But just the other day, I heard about a shooting on one of the blocks I judged at 58th and Cobbs Creek Parkway. Yeah, they got trees. So sometimes you wonder what happens and when did it happen? I, I'd just be an advocate for working together with people. Um, our neighborhood parks, our rec centers, yes, the children need a safe place to go and interact and be a part of. I remember they had a YWCA in my community in Germantown. And I was a teenager in a fashion show. Oh boy, we had a runway and everything. I was about 13. Where are those places now? Why can't we have those? I know we have certain problems with the pandemic and such, but we need to go back. Sometimes when you look at the wheel, you're not reinventing the wheel. 
you may be doing what's best. I would charge us to look at what's best and what worked and try to start from there in honor of Dr. King and all of those other people who led the charge before us. Um, hey, I'm a senior now, but what are we teaching? What's our legacy? Do we just let it go? I don't believe so. I think somebody in the audience somewhere is getting it right now. My hope. Yeah, I would just add to, to that. I mean, a wonderful uh, talk is, is the, the city of Philadelphia needs, you know, infrastructure. Uh, people think about infrastructure, think highways and, uh, Know, airports, but we need a major trash cleanup infrastructure bill. I mean, this is, uh, there's been so much neglect uh, in, um, you know, for a variety of reasons, but you just see the level of, of, of trash and illegal dumping that's occurring in neighborhoods now. And it's, I mean, uh, and it's something that you know, can't just be volunteers, but there's some resources. I mean, I think it would it would transform the city quickly in a lot of ways that people don't realize. Just picking up, getting, people will say, well, it just comes right back. It doesn't come back that fast. You know, it, that's an excuse to me. I think, you know, if there was some political will, I know I'm speaking outside of research here, but just from a policy perspective, I think some resources to really get back to cleaning up blocks would go a long way. And to, you know, to John's point, um, there needs to be some city emphasis on cleanup. Um, I love a good community service activity, some volunteerism. I love what that means um, for, for folks in terms of civic involvement, but it is not on volunteers and, um, and member residents of blocks to take up like short dumping. Um, and the massive amounts of like trash that we see in the city. And so there's something that needs to be carved or there's clear indication that um, legislatively and in terms of funding, there needs to be an effort towards cleanup um, that at the city level, for sure. Um, from a research perspective, and so to your, to your original question, um, my understanding and my experience has always been that uh, funders are going to look for those compelling metrics. And so they're gonna look for data. Um, and so research, there's an opportunity for research to bear out what um, neighbors are, and folks that are working around environmentalism are experiencing anecdotally and amplify um, the case for, and so through data collection and um, through like database narratives, um, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, um, to bear out a compelling case for why we need the um, funding um, to strategically <clears throat> kind of answer those questions around what is the, the right path um, towards improving our environment. Um, and so whether it is observational data um, or there are you know, some experiments themselves, um, you know, let's really amplify greening and, and encourage community buy-in um, or let's do some greening um, and have it be service provided. In my mind, I kind of do this experiment all the time. It's like, you know, who decided that this block needed to be cleaned up and greened up um, is always an indication for how long it stays cleaned up and greened up. <laughs> and so, um, but to um, to really, um, you know, give, um, give some credence to what we know, what we corely know um, in terms of a um, creating like a compelling database package for that. Um, is helpful in the case of funding because the bottom line is we certainly need funding. Um, we need funding and priority in terms of allocating that budget funding um, towards uh, whether it is uh, street tree planting uh, through a UC Green model, whether it is the city um, um, allocating more of the city budget towards um, cleanup and parks and recreation work and permitting to create more tree planting opportunities, whether it happens at the ZBA and so our zoning board um, uh, prioritizing a ratio for the number of like new construction development um, versus um, green lots and how um, how empty and available space is allocated so that there's a balance uh, 
between our development and our green spaces. I think that that would be incredibly timely. Um, and so there's, there's funding and priority that has to go into that. And I think that research can further the conversation and which compels better action. One thing I would add to that too is, uh, again, a really uh, effective overview is, I think one area where research could be really beneficial is actually uh, tracking um, the human activity, how that changes when places are cleaned up. You know, so if you have, you know, whether it's, you know, street view or other, you know, uh, you know, met metrics of kind of human activity, because then you'll see exactly what we're what we're talking about, which is people reclaiming the space. Uh, and then I think you can make the, a really strong case that you know when you green this lot and you plant the trees that the amount of time people are now spending in the space has increased um, and that i think is is compelling because then you know funders uh policymakers can't don't think that this is just an amenity that it, that that this actually does connect to actual use Lori, do you ever experience any resistance to tree planting do people ever push back on you Yes, I sum it up. Yes, you have tree haters, but overall their concern is the condition of their sidewalk, perhaps roots meandering into their plumbing systems. Um, those two, sidewalks, plumbing. But overall, most people want a tree. We have more wants than we can actually keep up with the request, so therefore there are backlogs on planting. Um, most people want a tree. Uh, um, and then we do inspect to where it can go. It has to go so many feet from a stop sign. It can't be near your underground utilities. So yes, overall, and, and I, I would like to see more corner properties planted, like on the side or, one thing I'm going to go there, backyards and alleyways, they're kind of not on the map in the city. If we could just renovate, clean, and restore our backyards and alleyways, we could have some opportunities to plant in the future. But right mm -hmm. now, that's like being in a Western with your lasso. We got to handle and corral those areas and most people know in the backyard and alleyway some places you can't walk through so backyards alleyways of the future united there's also some um work and uh, you know i can't speak to the kind of politics and 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 the process of making this happen but there is uh, emerging work also about you know, transforming concrete runoff and alleyways into more uh, less impervious space, you know, making plant, you know, uh, rain gardens and so forth. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, in the ideal world, we'd be, there'd be a lot of resources to think about being how creative with some of these alleyways that, you know, have maybe uh, people still want to use them, but they, you know, um, but maybe, you know, changing the, the layout more so that, uh, so that you can, so that they're basically more natural spaces than were originally designed for. Helpful. I want to be mindful of time and uh, give our audience a chance to ask some questions as well. Uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to place them in the chat, and we'll we'll take a look. And Darren, thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Uh, to see that you once had trees in your neighborhood or in the neighborhood you grew up in and now they're gone. That's, that's a painful thing, I would imagine. While people are thinking about their questions, um, I have another quote from Dr. King. Uh, One of the great tragedies of life is that men seldom bridge the gulf between practice and profession between doing and saying, we make our fervent pleas for the high road of justice, and then we tread unflinchingly the low road of injustice. And I'm aware that we could leave this time smarter, 
having a better understanding, but not really knowing what to do with the information. Uh, what can students, what can local residents do to get involved in this work? Um, so I think the easiest thing is, you know, engage your, engage your, um, your neighbors, folks in the, in your neighborhoods around greening, but more importantly, um, around greening equity. I think that this conversation with the, um, about the environment is so incredibly important for, um, Dr. King's vision of a, of equality in a connected community, um, because, your greenery and, and, and your part of town um, does not suddenly absolve you from the environmental, the climate change impacts of, um, of the rest of, 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 of other areas of the rest of the country, the rest of the world, the rest of Philadelphia. And so it's a shared effort. Um, and so we really focus on, and I know that uh, PHS is a wonderful opportunity for volunteering. Um, Tree Philly is always looking for folks to, um, to engage um, and organizing their uh, yard tree giveaways. Uh, you see Green takes on volunteers, but one of the things that all of these organizations are keenly focused on right now is equity. Um, and so how are we creating a balance and a fairly distributed um, canopy and greenness within our communities? And so that would be my charge to folks um, to support that work, to participate in that work. Um, and that support can look like just uh, signal boosting and being, you know, having conversations um, about the importance of being active environmentalism, more than talking about being active in environmentalism is being active. And so joining us, um, UC Green plants trees twice a year. We have seasonal pruning clubs. And so we get out and we do some tree maintenance um, in West Philadelphia. We uh, plant trees. We are currently reviewing along with the city and PHS 87 requests for trees across um, three West Philly zip codes. And so lots of opportunities to plant those trees and lots of work to get them in the ground and to make sure that those planting sites are uh, good planting opportunities. There's lots of work for folks to, um, to jump in on and I encourage you to do so. Walker Gosswich asks an interesting question. Uh, what do you think about green gentrification? Does greening uh, run the danger of displacing people? I, I don't see evidence of that. I mean, uh, what runs the risk of displacing people is new property development that increases tax uh, taxes or, dis or, or literally removes properties. Uh, but I don't think you should, um, I think it's something you wanna watch out for uh, and, and keep residents organized so that that doesn't happen. But, you know, I, I think sometimes that that can be used as a justification to let a place uh, continue to degrade, say, well, if we improve it, someone else is going to move here. And uh, I think that's a mistake. I mean, I think we, you know, um, uh, but uh, there are per certain neighborhoods where there is going to be more pressure for development. And, uh, and, and so it's something that needs to be uh, watched closely, um, you know, and, uh, and uh, so, but I don't think it's automatically going to happen. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I have had the occasion um, for folks to ingest and, and very like lovingly like, oh, here comes Keisha and the gentrification trees. <laughs> um, and so there, there is a, um, a notion or a thought um, that whenever you start to invest in a community and you're greening a community that's been previously neglected, um, that that is an indication that you're preparing um, that space and environment for um, a, a new population, um, or that it's an indication that, um, that someone else has moved in um, because there's different interest in investment. Um, and to that, and that's a, that's a difficult community conversation and a fair one, um, that I often navigate, but for, uh, for very many of the West Philadelphia neighborhoods that, um, that I serve and that I work with, um, it's a homecoming. It is returning back to greenness that was previously in that environment um, with um, mm -hmm. black and brown residents living in that community um, that the city um, through, you know, 
uh, um, this program was suspended or we had to do some um, some clearing to make um, make way for um, a new trolley line. Um, so there's there's always a story um, around like what happened, where the disinvestment in tree maintenance or um, tree removal occurred. And um, for me, it is a conversation about um, a homecoming. And so we're 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 coming back. It's it's a spirit of Sankofa. And so we're coming back and reclaiming. We're coming. Um, Sankofa is the notion of go back and get it. Um, and so we're, we're reclaiming those green spaces and that not that um, and it's easy within a generation. That's why I value my elders so much because they tell the stories that preceded me. Um, but it's easy for a generation to just have only known that lack of green. And it's a connection to understand that you're coming back and reclaiming um, what was lost in your neighborhood. Um, so that's how I've navigated it with, with some success. But yeah, the, the notion of Trees and gentrification is that there's definitely a an, an air of that. So we want mixed income neighborhoods, right? So you want some people to be able to move into places. I mean, that's how you have vibrant economy. So it's you don't want people displaced, but you know, we have neighborhoods that have less than half the population that they used to have. Um, and uh, you know, the city of Philadelphia was designed, if you will, for about 2 million residents. Where are we at? 1.6. I mean, there's a lot of space for people to reclaim uh, and move back into, um, but you don't want people displaced. But I think sometimes you people forget, depending on what neighborhood they're in, that there are, you know, swaths of North Philadelphia that are empty. You know, there's very few people living on a block now. So I think, you know, a lot could be done to, to help people reinvest in spaces, get people to move back in to the city. I mean, there's, there's, you know, it has to be managed though. Yeah, there, there have been a lot of questions related to maintenance of trees. Um, when you plant a tree, uh, is the block responsible to care for the tree or how do, how do trees get cared for it? How do we ensure that trees will still continue to be there after they've been planted? So, UC Green's modeling, UC Green is a tree tenders program. And so many neighborhoods have a tree tender program in their neighborhood. Um, we plant the trees um, alongside, you know, with the interest of, um, of residents. Um, and then the maintenance of the tree is something that's shared. And so we make our best efforts to, if you have a concern, a problem with a tree that we've planted um, with you, reach out to us and we'll share and caring for that tree. Um, but in general, the, the responsibility falls on the, the homeowner. And so education on how to maintain a tree is important at that time. It's great, I'm responsible for caring for this tree. What does that mean? You know, what are the mulching needs? Um, what are proper pruning techniques? Um, but then also to, to the extent that we are able to uh, support the maintenance of a tree, UC Green and Tree Tenders programs uh, will participate in seasonal pruning, um, tree assessments, mulching a tree is so important. I, I have told so many neighbors the, yes, the tree roots in your pipe is a thing. Um, one of the easiest ways to combat that is to not have that tree look for a watering source. Um, and so that is by thoroughly watering your tree regularly and making sure that, that tree is maintaining moisture through proper mulching. But that is, that's tree maintenance education. So you can't just tell someone you're responsible for this tree now and not give them the tools to be responsible for that tree. Um, um, and volunteerism. And so um, UC Green's Pruning Club is made up of neighbors who want to kind of hands-on receive that, that education on how to maintain a tree and provide the service of maintaining the tree. So our uh, tree tenders, our um, longtime volunteers will work with um, neighbors that might wanna just come out just to get out the house um, on a random day and on-site provide that education while also maintaining um, a block's trees. And that, that kind of mixed model has been helpful for us. Um, it is not solving the problem of tree maintenance. It is, um, it is a dent um, in providing some solution for some residents. And so um, a policy around maintenance would be really, you know, who is responsible for maintaining the trees and how are they maintained is really important. Um, our street trees are 
different than, you know, yard trees and park trees and that, that there's so much shared responsibility. Um, it is the property owner, it is um, Pico, you know, if, um, if the trees are um, conflicting with some power lines, um, it is uh, PWD and the water department, um, if the trees are um, somehow um, impeding access to, uh, to water, or to pipes. And so being on one accord in terms of policy, policies for tree maintenance and how we manage our trees be a helpful thing. I think the Philly Tree Plan um, keenly honed in on that and is working towards creating some policies around addressing that. So I look forward to seeing that in implementation. To Darren's question, there's a question in the comments um, about making developers plant um, trees. That exists. Um, and so for, for, large, um, for large planting, I mean, for large um, construction projects, um, they have to submit a, um, a greening plan, which includes um, trees per um, however many feet um, for the project. I will say, and um, I think that we've all, um, you know, tree advocates in the city have talked about this, the problem lies in enforcement. There is a penalty for not, um, for not adhering to that green plan. Um, and the, the penalty or the fine for it is negligible. Uh, you know, if you're, you have a massive project and you have the opportunity to get another unit in or two more parking spots and forego planting the tree and play, pay a small fee for that, and that's fine. Um, and that's what we, we often see happening um, with a lot of our uh, construction pro projects, particularly in West Philly. And so the enforcement um, of, um, of those policies, but also um, uh, making those fines or the penalty a little more, maybe it's not even just a fine, but making the penalty a little more uncomfortable are um, two really great ways to, uh, from a policy perspective, advocate for trees. Lori, it looks like you have one final comment. Well, no, I would. I just wanted to add that the city of Philadelphia, we're still in the tree planting business and we do plant a larger size tree, like a two inch caliper tree. People are on the list. Um, I would say, do your research and Google. We have street tree management. You can get a permission slip for an inspection at your home. Uh, you need to be the homeowners. We, we do not let people who are renters uh, gain access to placing a tree in front of a house. Uh, but the maintenance, yes, we ask that it's shared in communities. Yes, there are many tree tender organizations, but there are lists each year. It's about budgeting and financing uh, to plant various species of trees. Thank you. Well, we are running up on the top of the hour. Uh, thank you. This has been fascinating, uh, so helpful, and uh, look forward to continuing to get more trees in the city and to, to participate in that in some way with our office even as well. I want to pass it back to Nina now, and um, thank you all for being here. Oh, great. Thank you all so much. Uh, this has been such a wonderful conversation. I know I've learned a lot, and I've also gotten a great sense of how we can all get engaged. I think it was one message I heard loud and clear is that we need to be um, civically engaged with our community to really help address these issues. And so to do that, our, um, our office will follow up with anyone who is registered with ways to get involved with UC Green, uh, links to the Tree Philly Plan, so that you can take the, the messages that we learned today and put them into action. So again, thank you all so much for participating in this event hosted by the Office for Sustainability, as well as the Office of Social Equity and Community here at Penn. Uh, thanks to our speakers, and I hope you all have a great day.